Welcome to Comic Book Nation and our special post-Christmas episode where we are doing one thing and one thing only. We are talking Wonder Woman 1984 in full spoiler discussion. We already did a kind of spoiler-free impression for you guys on our last regular episode, but on this special episode, we are digging in deep to everything Wonder Woman 1984, and we are going to be breaking down a lot of the big talking points that have come out of this movie, and it's very unprecedented launch on HBO Max at the same time in theaters. So with me today for that special podcast, I've got my regular co-host Janelle Wheeler. Hey everybody. I have Mr. Producer Jim Viscardi back with us. Oh, hello. And one of our resident comic DC, we'll throw in Marvel, everything experts back with us. Jenna Anderson is back. Hey everybody. Thank you for the ovation. I hope you guys. <laughs> we have we have a standing ovation. It's just separate. I will, I will stand yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, oh, God. We, we need we need an applause button as well. Uh, I'm tight into this little setup. I do not have room to stand up, but I I would if I could. Um, but thank you guys all for joining me and taking uh, some time out of the uh, holiday to come on and uh, break down this thing, Wonder Woman 1984. Without further ado, let's just get into it because, like I said, this is the thing, only thing we're doing on this special episode. So, first up, I don't need to go over my own impressions. If you want to hear that, you can listen to the last episode where me and Nicole Drum brought it, kind of uh, gave you our feel, which was basically we both liked it. Um, I think I was in the camp of saying I understand some of the divisive opinions that are going to come out of the film going in, just having done enough of this and specifically DC films enough. I knew. <laughs> kind of where we were headed and sure enough we are there and so i'm not going to retread that that's how i felt let's go around and hear from the people we haven't heard from who got to see the movie uh let's start with you janelle what did you think yeah. of Wonder Woman 1984 then we'll jump to jenna and jim gentlemen as always will go last so um i honestly my opinion is totally different i thought it was a great movie uh, to experience with my family at home on Christmas. We were looking forward to it all day and I watched it with my parents and my fiance. Um, and I left feeling great, excited, especially with the end credit scene. I lost my mind. I was just pumped. And then I started speaking to my family members who um, have not seen the first Wonder Woman with Gal. And they were well, my mom fell asleep. <laughs> oh, no. And, yes. And, um, and it, yeah, I, it was, it was, I think it's very difficult for um, people who are not like huge comic book fans and watchers and, and consumers and uh, don't have context to take this movie in. Um, they don't understand the relationship with, you know, her boyfriend and why it's such a big deal. Like I cried when she had to renounce her wish. Um, I was extremely emotionally invested and they were just kind of like, who's this dude? Like, and why does he look like this other guy? And I, um, I'm so glad they didn't talk during the movie and spoil, like mess that up for me because as a fan and someone who really liked the first one, it spoke to me and I, I understood exactly what they were doing. I will say that, um, I think everyone really enjoyed the opening part, uh, where they showed the baby girl, um, just killing it and being really creative and understanding like what her whip is about. And, and I feel like they did a good job of explaining things for those who hadn't watched it. That's what I felt like, you know, I thought that she talked about her boyfriend before he was reintroduced. I thought that she explained her, you know, her, her position of like who she is and what she's about. I, I, I very much thought it was great, but it is very interesting to hear from people who don't know, who don't know all of that, don't have that information. You, you bring up a really interesting point in that, like your mom had no context coming in. Right. And because of that, she was immediately caught catching up. And so right. should a, do, or does a good movie um, do that? Like, right? Like, I, I don't yeah. and that's, and, and like, they're all so they difficult to do. We'll, we'll You're asking get, a question that goes. You should have been asking like in the late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but no, but I, but I and we'll get and we'll get to kind of my thought my thoughts about the air. But I mean, but like that's I think one of the biggest points that I see um, a lot of people having a hard time getting over. If you have watched Wonder Woman, if you have 
uh, you know, kind of been following along, then it's then it's not then it's not as as bad as yeah, I mean, uh, even just simply to watching it. the trailer. Like if you right. hadn't watched the trailer, you're like, what is yeah, the, but like, let's pass the caveat that yeah. most of these people we're talking about probably wouldn't have gone out to a theater true. to yeah. see Wonder Woman very, as opposed to just true. Laying not and I'm not saying this about your mother, Janelle. I'm yeah. saying just like laying back in the couch, like I don't get it. Well, yeah, it no, seriously, so it's, like, yeah. that's 100 percent the truth, and that's why like I have no shame saying like I really loved this because I knew I had some backstory, I knew what it was going to be about, and I really enjoyed experiencing it at home. So I can only imagine I would have loved experiencing it in the theater. So yeah, all right, let's move to Jenna. Jenna, what did you think? Let's get you in here. All right. Well, so I'm kind of in the same camp as you and Janelle in that I really enjoyed it. Um, I know rewatching it the second time on Christmas Day, because like watching it on the screen or on my laptop was one thing, but then getting to see it on like the 80 inch TV at my mother-in-law's house, I was like, oh, this is the closest I'm getting to the cinematic experience right now. Like I can't go to a movie theater. I'm totally fine with that, but it still felt more epic seeing it in a bigger context. Um, I, to me, what I love so much about the movie it has flaws and I will not deny the fact that it has flaws, but it feels like such a love letter both to like the Donner Superman movie era and also to just like silver and bronze age comics. Like I've been reading a lot of bronze age comics just kind of in my spare time this year. And it feels like such a reflection of that kind of storytelling of like, yeah, some things might not make sense. There's some things that don't necessarily age well, but it, it's trying to just make you feel a very specific emotion and walk away with a lesson. And I feel like the movie really, really succeeds in that. That's something I wanted to touch on. So let's just kind of segue into that, which is the first question I had on here is, did this story make sense to you? Um, my feeling was, if nothing else, I thought the story element of Wonder Woman 1984 was my favorite portion of it because I was actually surprised by how much uh, depth it had. And, and when I kind of reexamined it again, how well it actually holds together. I've seen some kind of criticism online saying people felt it was kind of a slapdash story and thrown together. And that's the one part I think I would stand on a hill and argue about. I don't feel like this was a slapdash thrown together story. I think there's a lot of it that makes sense. Um, I think that a lot of it makes sense if you're willing to kind of take the deeper subtext of the story as a, as opposed to just doing comic book stuff. Cause some people say like the Dreamstone, it, it, I don't get it. Like, why didn't they just wish did nobody wished for like peace and all that happy stuff. And it's like, well, no, if you pay attention, the Dreamstone is a monkey's paw. They keep saying that to you to, it's not just an open genie. It, it doesn't just grant wishes. It grants wishes that are supposed to be kind of deceptions. It gives you something while taking away something more important. So it's not like really a real wish grander. So you can't like just use it to wish for world peace because it's probably not going to do that for you. Now, if you wish for something selfish, like I have all the power to enforce world peace because I have all the guns, then like, yeah, it takes, it gives you that, but it also like takes your family because they get killed as a violent act or something. And that's kind of how it works. And the movie really is clear about these rules, but I feel like people kind of are missing some of those subtle beats and i think that's an important hinge because it feeds into the character story right about why these three individuals diana steve and maxwell lord why the real villain isn't like a villain of massing power but them dealing with their own stuff with this kind of you know metaphorical MacGuffin, this dreamstone used as the kind of focal point for them and that's what kind of created the power for the story like i got emotional too in this movie when you know diana had to renounce her wish in knowing what that meant and even you know i I was a blubbering idiot when Maxwell Lord's, you know, feeling and maybe it's just me having a two year old son right now, but like, you know, that whole thing about doing all this stuff because he, at the end of the day, just wants to be a big man and impress his son and do all that. And, you know, and the way that's resolved, I liked it that it wasn't traditional superhero, like villain just wants big thing to make him feel <laughs> like he has bigger peace, you know, and man, yeah, the and, villain had a sob story, which is kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. And it was about emotional stuff. And mm -hmm. I think, I like that it feels like a, a female driven superhero story in thematics and not just swapping out characters. Like mm -hmm, there, right. there was something unique that these, this director and you know, this star were required to tell. And I think I love this more, like I said on the podcast, learning more about Patty Jenkins and through Rogue Squadron and her personal history and how much of this, that I see in this about her dad and being a pilot and wishing for things back that you've lost and all that stuff. It's intensely mm -hmm. personal. So I really love the story. Um, how about you guys? I think for for me, one of the 
it, it's interesting. I watched it with uh, my five year old who, if HBO Max wanted to green light a young Diana series, like she would be so all awesome. that would that be amazing. Almost, almost immediately. I mean, even my fiance was like, I just want a story about like of her coming to age. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. like, like it was, it was, it was, all, I don't know. this movie has a lot of, a lot of weird things about it. Right. Like there, <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it very much has a, you know, a, a clear through line, which is, a, which is an argument I don't necessarily get where people are like, Oh, the story like kind of goes all over the place. I go, I don't know if we watch the same movie because it really kind of like holds your hand. Yeah. It's almost really pretty so much. much. Through yeah. uh, through through the movie, I think the the thing for me is uh, I think it was a little bit too long. I think at at around at around two hours yeah, there are some, well no there, I think like look I, it's it's one of those I don't know what the extra time accomplished other than potentially just like linger a little bit too long in in certain moments uh now i obviously i'm not saying this is, this is a movie that needs to be uh an hour and a half but like you know an hour and 40 minutes hour 50 you know like it, that that's probably where i think certain scenes can get cleaned up uh can, can get cleaned up a little bit um you know I, there there's obviously a lot of you know criticism around the uh the, like steve trevor of it uh, the steve trevor of it all but i think it it's one of those those instances where like it, it seems like you know jenkins and, and company wanted to make a movie that felt like it came out in the 80s and so because of that you know they do things that have the movie feel like it came out in the 80s yeah and, i was gonna say that um and like is you that separate, but like you cannot like, separate is that, is, old 80s ideas from from 80s movies they were <laughs> right. ideas that made that cinema era happen and you can't separate those two right um and like and so, like, like, I I don't know what the expectations of this movie were, right? In that, like, it just in in following the discourse and uh, and all that, like, I don't I don't know what anyone was expecting outside of just like another Wonder Woman movie. And I think that's where a lot of the 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 I guess the hate that this movie is kind of getting. Where if you took this movie for what it was. Um, it like it feels like a, it feels like a nice retro, you know, a nice throwback kind of thing. We're look, we're living in an age where like nostalgia is king right now, and so how is that? You know, a, a movie that basically is shot and filmed like it took place in 1984, not that for more people. Uh, but I think it's for some of the reasons that even you know Janelle Janelle mentioned, like with her parents. I think there was a bit of a barrier for people who wanted to go to, to watch a Wonder Woman movie and have it feel like it maybe was a bit more for them to go try it out, but doesn't do enough to explain why things are the way they are. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's a movie that like, I, I will, the, one of the criticisms I agree with is I feel like it didn't have enough Diana in it, or, you know, enough Wonder Woman in it. The, the moment, the parts that did have Wonder Woman in it, I loved. Uh, and I thought were, were some of the best parts of the movie, but it felt few and far between which is what brings me back to my i think it was a little bit too long where if it was a little shorter i feel like you would have felt like you got more wonder woman in those moments um uh, evened it out a little bit i'm ironically the exact opposite if i were to trim parts of this movie the first things i would do is go back to those action sequences i would trim the mall sequence i would definitely cut the middle eastern sequence almost entirely because i don't think you really need it yeah that would accomplish need. anything they were just chasing Maxwell Lord and didn't catch him. Um, so I think you could just cut that and go straight to the White House scene. And I would have made the cheetah scene a little bit longer. I mean, that's kind of just my edits. Uh, Janelle, Jenna, let's yeah. start, just go to Jenna. What did you think uh, about the story versus the action? Um, I think, again, it kind of, yeah, it's very different from what people are kind of used to with superhero blockbusters right now. Like they're used to an end game style movie that even though there is a lot of character stuff and a lot of talking, the action kind of balances it out. I do think like, yeah, going into it, I would have expected maybe a little bit more action, but I feel like the scenes that they had mattered so much and felt again, it, it felt like an eighties movie in the sense that you go into an eighties movie. It's maybe a little bit longer than it necessarily needs to be. It maybe like kind of sits around and lingers and stuff that it doesn't necessarily need to, but you still get this more comprehensive viewing experience out of it in a way that is like meaningful and is trying to further transport you into that. 
Um, yeah, I, I almost, I wish that there was something in this movie that felt akin to the no man's land sequence in the first movie, because that is still just like mm -hmm. so powerful and Green. like seeing, seeing that in theaters, like every time I remember just even watching it in theaters, it's like, I get goosebumps. Like, I feel like if I had maybe seen this on an IMAX screen with a packed audience on an, on an opening day, there might've been moments that would have translated like that to me. But in the, the context of watching it at home on HBO max, there was stuff that still made me emotional and there were action action sequences that were still really well executed, but there wasn't something on that level of like, Oh my gosh, this is like completely changing the game for superhero movies and especially female led superhero movies. Agreed. I got the honor of going and seeing that scene first screened for like the first time over in London during an Edibe visit. And I got to walk up to Patty Jenkins over afterwards and be like, you did it. You did it at a time where she was not even like confident. And I sounded like a crazy person, I'm sure. Um, but she was like, thanks. And I was like, no, you did it. You like, you don't understand. You did it. And then like, yeah, um, there was that. I will say that caveat. There was that no man's land goosebump like feeling sequence that was missing from this movie i do feel like the closest thing is kind of like when she's flying for the first time like that yeah. and the invisible jet scene are really the two scenes to me that like definitely gave me goosebumps and made me emotional but it's more of a subdued feeling that you get out of that it's not this kind of like big triumphant like boundary breaking thing that the no man's land scene was yeah, agree. Better first flight than Man of Steel. I'll put that out there. And I love Man of Steel. <laughs> um, Janelle, what did you think about action entertainment, especially for the people who didn't really know what they were getting into? I mean, I, th I thought it was great. I think I think the Invisible Jet scene was way too long. Like, I was just kind of going, okay, why are we flying through fireworks? Like, I get it if yeah. you want it for, like, the trailer to have something really exotic and beautiful looking but it took it it took up way too much time like it's little moments like that that went on too long that they could have like jim said cut down and it would have <laughs> the novelty of it really like wore yeah. off well yeah i mean the most exciting part to me about the invisible jet was when they're taking off and when it becomes invisible the whole like fireworks scene didn't even need to happen and if they wanted to make it happen they could have cut it down like there like i said there are a few moments like that throughout the whole thing that i'm like they're dragging this out. Like, why are they dragging this out? Even some of Pedro scenes. I mean, I love his acting. He's phenomenal. But I was like, I don't need this much of him. Like, I get it. He is this kind of guy. This is his backstory. Like that. Those were my criticisms. Right. But like, I had nothing to do on Christmas. I couldn't visit family. So for me, like a long movie was fine. <laughs> but but <laughs> if I was in the theater and I had to use the restroom, I would be a little like I would be running out during the fireworks scene. <laughs> And like going to, well, you know, again, this is another one of those cases where I do kind of wonder about the format we're seeing this. Like, would the fireworks sequence feel differently oh, right. in a major That's theater? Um, stunning, with, right? Well, yeah. But even on that, even on that scene, like the part that they probably could have trimmed is the part of like Diana looking down at the clouds, right? You can still have the the scene of them like just going through and the fireworks are blowing up in the sky. They're having an explosion, but then right. like it, it it lingers too long, where you just yeah. like you're looking at the clouds, you know, kind of color up like that. Like I specifically remember that as a moment where I literally looked down at my phone, to just like. <laughs> Like yeah. check something else and then and then came back to it because i was like oh, okay are we still doing this um <laughs> well she had to set up the emotional payoff so that when steve is gone later and she's in the cloud she can remember these memories i mean i thought the flying scene was and too long too fly. Fly, <laughs> just on the buoyancy of america's july 4th celebration then they, then they needed to make then they needed to make the plane part shorter to, to make time for the clouds like that i like, don't believe what i'm hearing this is the most <laughs> anti-american crap i've ever heard <laughs> oh, we needed less fireworks in the, uh, the july scene no but but it's, uh, it's funny, it's not to, Russia, to what you know, mentioned, you know mentioned about about uh, Maxwell Lord, which it, it's interesting because like I felt like they they spent a lot of time with Maxwell Lord, but like the one thing that they didn't really explain, and I get it, like they don't you don't need to explain everything, but like they didn't necessarily explain the stakes of what being basically the stone was. You knew his health was failing him. You knew like you could tell like his eyes bloodshot or whatever. But like if that were to continue, like what would have happened? You've seen uh, Band of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. No, <laughs> but like, but like, could, but then, but then, but then that brings up that brings up the other point, right? Like, like, did you need Diana to stop Maxwell Lord? And 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 like, if Maxwell Lord was inevitably going to, you know, kill himself anyway from from just doing all this wish stuff, uh, you know, to to like to what end, right? And right. so, and so not not that it like 
like that ruins the movie for me. It absolutely doesn't. And like, and I, I look at these, I look at these movies in a way and like, and like grade them at, on a scale of like, will I watch, will I rewatch it? And there are plenty of other movies I will not rewatch. And this, this is one I probably would watch. Yeah, I agree. Me too. Over again. And so, All and, right. that, and like that instance, it works for me. Let's get to some of the more, before we get out of here, I'm going to take on just some of the more controversial scenes that seem to be really becoming big talking points on social media right now. Um, there are two. There is, and uh, this gets a little more adult, kids. I'm sorry, but we're just going to talk about some of this stuff. The first scene is Barbara's transformation and the kind of pivotal scene using these two people on the street that she knows. This this guy who's a sexual, you know, harassed or drunk, possibly worse, um, and the homeless man that she helps. So there's that sequence where she's fully, you know, we're at midpoint becoming Cheetah where she's getting the physical strength and all that stuff. And she gets, she sees that guy who harassed her and tried to assault her before. And then there's this very dark scene where she just like nearly beats him to death in the street. Um, A lot of people have a lot of problems with this scene saying Mm -hmm. that they don't understand kind of the point of view they're supposed to take or like what side they're supposed to take. You're, You're not supposed to side with this guy who's harassing and attacking women, but are you not supposed to root for Barbara either? Um, my takeaway from this scene is it's a very difficult scene and a very, I mean, ballsy one for lack of a better term to put into a movie, because I think the point is again, the dreamstone. If you go back to kind of the thematics, it is that yes, Barbara now has the power to turn around and, and dominate this guy who was trying to dominate her. But I think the commentary that the movie says is that it's not kind of justice or, or this kind of balancing thing to just take power and use it badly against people who have used it badly against you and to do that and that in her kind of sacrificing her the nice parts and that's what the guy the bum is there for right to balance out that she's not just this is not like a cathartic celebration it's her losing the part of herself that made her a good person a compassionate person even though she was mistreated often she still had a heart and, and all that good but that she's losing that and and that's and it's supposed to scare you i think does that does that come girl. before or after Diana points that out to her? Like it's you know, uh, it is before. Okay, yeah, that's it's, right. like, it's like at least a half an hour before. I feel like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because this is when Barbara's still kind of secretly going through this transformation right. process. Um, I feel like it's supposed to create juxtaposition. Like it's you're supposed yeah. to see that like how Diana handled it as opposed to how you know Cheetah's going to handle it going forward. She wished to be just like her. But yet she's not, she's, Mm -hmm. she's not, she can't be her because she doesn't have that truth and like the honor and all of that stuff holding her, you know, accountable. So that's cool. Well, and I would argue, like, I've seen so many people who have just really liked Cheetah, or really, they've liked the Barbara parts of Cheetah almost more than the final scene of Cheetah, because just her characterization is so strong. And it's like, I feel like that scene, as controversial as it might be, feels kind of like an extension of the reason why people relate to her. Like, yeah, she is kind of losing part of her humanity and part of herself. But then at the same time, when you look at Wonder Woman as a character who was created by a guy who was overly feminist and was using the book to kind of tackle myself misogyny and all of the different things that like women face it felt like kind of an extension of that like yeah it's supposed to be controversial but you're supposed to kind of be thinking about it as it's happening right and i i agree 100 percent in that like final barbara is almost feels like an entirely different character yeah and the barbara that we got to know yeah in the like like even throughout her transformation or whatever like her you know like i want to be you know an apex predator and Mm -hmm. all that. like i don't i don't necessarily know like that if that was like like literally from there is where it like just mm-hmm. kind of goes off the rail for me rails for me with her character and even that fight like the stakes don't i don't i, I don't know what those stakes are because like what like what's what's the outcome there like oh she beats cheetah okay well t- you know to get to max alert okay fine but like what does that mean you know Whoa. for barbara what does that mean for for cheetah after <laughs> I think it's Barbara to Diana story is an understated thing that that does deserve more discussion because it is about a subtle thing about kind of female friendships and looking at each other and her seeing Diana as her imagined way of this is how I become powerful or better or is being somebody else, which is, again, a bad notion. She was already a good person and had her own good qualities that she just was not embracing. And I think I, I believe the transformation because 
you know, I think it was a kind of a metaphorical real life thing to a person who goes through that period of maybe adolescence when they're not popular in something and then they grow into themselves. And this is male and female. I've seen it on both sides. When an, the ugly duckling grows into a beautiful swan, but becomes like really a bastard <laughs> at the same time when they get that kind of like taste of this thing they didn't have before. And it's corrupting, right? Like I know plenty of people who become the, the pretty person who now is no longer a nice person at the same time. Um, and so I thought their friendship was at the stakes. It wasn't a stake for the movie. It was a stake between these two women. And like, what happens if, when they have this conflict, um, uh, we could take about the steps of that. The other thing I thought it was that's important to note for Wonder Woman is Wonder Woman. Part of what I love about her character and the, and the people who get that character right is that she has this massive amount of power on the level of Superman, but how she chooses to use it is very different. Mm -hmm. Love is her and compassion is her power. Like that is the core of it, right? Um, and so the cheetah scene actually reminded me of an echo of the scene briefly in the first film at the end where Steve dies and Diana goes ape crap for a minute there and just starts wiping out soldiers. I mean, these are bad World War I, two soldiers, but you're just like, holy crap for a minute. Cause mm -hmm. she's just, I mean, she can slaughter these people before she has to kind of pull it together again and, and you know, say that's not the way like I do things and that's not the way I use my power. And so I thought that was important. And I thought, like you said, the justification with Cheetah was important. The other lingering topic of we just want to talk talk about is the the eighties body swapping in the woke wokeness of twenty twenty. Um doesn't seem to be going over well with people. Uh this idea that Steve Trevor inhabited this other man's body and then, you know, did all these things with Diana, including, you know, sexual activity, obviously, has some people freaking oh out. Oh, my God, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would first say we should do a PSA for non-binary tri trans soul people. Like, don't insult them. You don't know. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. But in all seriousness, like, I don't know. That's just an 80s idea. I can't, like, really speak to that, like switcheroo freaky fridays and things like that are kind of just from that tradition so i don't know if i don't it's know a, how it's, a, it's, a t it's a tough one it's it's a tough yeah. one to 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 kind of dissect in in that because it feels like there are a number of other ways they could have brought steve back that it that they didn't necessarily need to. And so so it's easy to kind of write off oh like the 80s of it all but like we're not in the eighties. Right. And so like, I get that it's, you know, it, it's an eighties movie and it is a thing that, um, you know, that, that happened. It's just weird. It's a, it's a weird, it's a, it's a bit of a weird decision to make. Um, that no, I feel like they, again, they, that they, that they could have gotten around. Let's just ground this. But again, it's part of the story, right? Like, no, I understand that it's it, really right. get Steve back. Right. It's a delusion. It's, it's a right. kind of self deluded thing that she kind of, slips into um Jenna, it sounds like you were about to, it looks like you were about to say something no i i'm i'm completely in the same camp of like i was kind of thinking about it earlier it feels very akin to like a movie like big where if you think mm -hmm. about the relationship in big and the fact that it's a kid who wished to be an adult and then like had a relationship with an adult woman it kind of breaks your brain a little bit so yeah, yeah. it is like the, the you're it, ruining me i've <laughs> never thought of these things I'm you're corrupting me <laughs> or die sketch where the genders get reversed and it is so funny because then like when when the adult man thinks about it he's like oh my god i'm gonna go to jail this is so horrible and so like i like i see oh this as kind of an extension of yes it is an 80s thing like yeah there is a conversation to be had about that scene and about the kind of 2020 lens to look at look through it but again i don't yeah. feel like i don't feel like patty and the people involved with this movie were deliberately trying to court a controversy i think it was just oh, kind God. of leaning into the weirdness of an 80s movie and leaning right. into the weirdness of the comics like there are so many weird comics where it's like oh well <laughs> Lane gets body swapped with somebody or steve gets body swapped with somebody like there's a there, that that is a trope that gets used very liberally in comics and doesn't really have a lot of justification behind it, it other than that it's just what the story needs and so i kind of saw this as that of like it's just what the story needed to move forward i would have loved to have seen an all alternate version where you didn't necessarily need to use another dude to make it happen. But I feel I can respect the decision of using it that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, wow. it's funny too, because um, it, you, you, you brought up the analogy uh, twice now about uh, like this movie feeling like, like feeling like a comic book. And, it, and honestly, it really does. And it's one of those things that like, that I, that I kind of love about it. It's, it's got, you know, it's got so it's got such bombast to it. 
that that really like you know it, it you get from like bombast to bombast to bombast kind of throughout throughout the movie but like to me it's what you know at the end of the movie looking back on it i go i had a I had some fun and that was just like a nice, you know, a nice fun thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I, I also kind of wanted to circle back to one more point that, that Kofi made about uh, Diana and her powers um, because I, uh, a thing that happened in the movie that I thought was actually really interesting was everyone remembers the big moment of Diana clacking her wrists together and just like, you know, doing that, that giant thing. And that was a big kind of like holy S moment uh, in the first one. And it, in in this one like her go-to move didn't work as well and like and like she had to come up and do you know do other things to uh, to do that and i really liked that as an exploration of diana's other abilities and thing other things that she's capable of outside of you know what could have been easy as to why why doesn't she just do the thing why doesn't she just you know do that and so so I, I really, I really like that point. I didn't mean to necessarily backtrack a little bit, but I thought that well, was. I, I wanted to bring up kind of as an extension of that. Like I remember when the first trailer came out, Gal and Patty were saying like she isn't using her shield and she isn't using her sword, and they were like she doesn't need to in this movie because she's not going to war. She's just dealing mm -hmm. with interpersonal conflict. She's not dealing with hundreds of soldiers in battle. And I love in the movie that they acknowledge it because they're at the White House and Steve goes and grabs like a katana off the wall and like a, sh a plate or something from the White House, and she's like, no, don't use that because the people under Maxwell Lord's control don't like they don't have agency in this scenario they don't deserve to be dealt with in that kind of way because this is outside of their control and so I love yeah. that because it feels like this extension of how do you use her powers and her skill set without just being like oh I'm just going to mow people down with my sword and my shield yeah well it's funny too because I think it's one of those things and, and like the movie as a whole and like the setup of the premise with the villain and whatever uh like that that one and it's and it's the biggest problem with these like potentially shared universe type movies is like where the hell was the justice league when maxwell lord is going is, is going you know doing all of this crazy stuff right like it's just diana on her own like what, like what's going yes. on um, it's a like, ten-year-old like, Bruce Wayne who's very, very sad <laughs> at the same exact time. Oh, oh right, oh, you're right. You're, you're yeah. totally right. I totally forget that this is all right. This is in NA4. Just League isn't uh, necessarily around uh, yet, but like, but at the same time, it's like, uh, like, is she literally the only one? Right. I guess she would have been. Now that I'm, now I'm thinking about it, I'm like, okay, now, yeah. now it makes more sense. And now I take that back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, can we take uh, a couple of questions from the chat? Uh, yes. We got time for one or two, yeah. Okay, so uh, like right off the bat, um, Dom Solo was kind of calling out Gal's acting chops. What are your thoughts on um, her portrayal of Diana and her what? acting up against Chris Pine and Pedro and all of that? The like Chris Pine getting dressing and like her, uh, you know, just like her witty banter. With, the, I could watch a movie with the two of them. I don't care what the hell it is. Like they could read the phone book together. And I it's like, they have, I thought such great chemistry, but I think Diana on her own has really cemented her wonder woman. And, and, and I love it. Like that, like that's like, to me, that's the thing. It's like, I, it's, um, I, we're going to look back in like 30 years. And like, we, like we are going to look at wonder woman in the same way that like, you know, my parents' generation or whatever, look at Linda Carter as their, as their Wonder Woman. And I think that's a really cool, uh, a cool thing. And I think she got through a lot of the important moments of this movie really, really well. I also don't think a lot of people ever understand or appreciate like the straight man role in, in a kind of comedic ensemble. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what that means, it's, it's straight man is basically the person it's basically Michael Bluth and Jason Bateman in Arrested Development, right? Like all the other characters are zany and oversized, but there has to be a person who's kind of straight faced and, and kind of dry. And in the first film, it was more Chris Pine's role to be that. Well, Diana was wide eyed and naive and cute. And in this one, she is the kind of straight man to mm -hmm. it's a reversal. He's the wide eyed, naive person. And she's the straight man who kind of is just like, OK, kid, come along. And I think a lot of people think that's like bad acting, but it, it actually takes a lot to be a good straight man. To be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. And it, and so I, I've never put it. Plus, she is Wonder Woman now. So she could just walk down the street as Gal Gadot and I'll be like, Wonder Woman! Um, so like, yeah, I'm not mad about that. Was there one more question before we get out of okay. here? Hold on, I, hold on. I want to know what uh, Jenna... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Jenna. No, I completely agree. Just co-sign everything y'all just said. So. <laughs> Perfect. Nothing will be as bad as when I took my mom to the Wonder Woman premiere and in a van full of people, she came out and everybody was gushing about Gal Gadot. And she was like, she looks all right. 
<laughs> and just dead silence <laughs> and in the van. And I was like, Ma! And just like, yeah, that was great. But uh, anyway, moving right along was our second question. Um, Nerd with Tech is I'm excited for the next movie uh, where she should be flying a lot more. What are your thoughts for the next one since we know well, um, it's That's a perfect dovetail because that's what we were going to end with. So Norbit, perfect. thank you. Um, I'm in for Wonder Woman 3. I think we can stop with the period thing. I don't think we need to do the X-Men type deal here like hopping decades. I don't need Wonder Woman 1996. Um, like, even though I love 96, but uh, yeah, I don't need like a biggie joke or something or, you know, East coast, West coast. Like I, I think we can just go to modern times and start to progress this story past the Snyderverse and just see, and I love the Snyderverse. I don't well, think, I think that's, but that's the biggest question though, right? Like what does present, like what does a present day Wonder Woman look like? Like, is it that's like, why we need Wonder Woman three, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I mean, but like, but like in a world where like, we're, we're about to get the Snyder cut and this is theoretically the same Diana and like Flashpoint's going to happen. Like it, it'll be really interesting to see how they make that. Work. Am I excited for it? A hundred percent. I'm just really curious to see how they have to basically move the chess pieces on the board to get to that point, And then what, what that leaves Patty and Gal to do for the third movie. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And I'm kind of in the mindset of like, my hope for Wonder Woman 3 is you kind of further expand her supporting cast because she has a lot of supporting characters in the comics who are beloved and who deserve to be on the big screen in some context. And there's like any combination of them that you could fit together that would be really interesting. And like, for me personally, ever since it was announced that like this one was going to be in the 80s, I was like, okay, so the third one should be set in the present day. And you should have Charlize Theron and Patty reunite and team up again and have her play Ver Veronica Kale because that is mm -hmm. a Wonder Woman wonder woman villain who is like very underrated and who feels really perfect in kind of a modern day context and so i feel like that would be kind of my hope for the movie but i know whatever idea patty and gal have going on is probably going to be great either way so <laughs> Janelle, did you have any thoughts? You know, honestly, uh, the only thing, because you guys have so much more to go off of, um, and I just respect all's opinions so much, but the only thing that kind of like sat kind of weird with me was Cheetah didn't renounce her wish and they left her hanging in a really weird place and there was no bow on the end of her story and I was very confused and I'm like, are they going to bring her back? And that's the only thing I can think of for the next movie. Like, are they going to bring her back and finish her story? Or like, what happened to her? Is she like, was her wish taken away from her? We literally didn't see her renounce it. We saw her almost renounce it, but she didn't. And I'm just like, is that going to, is she going to be in modern day in the next movie with <laughs> Diana? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I think I just want to see, yeah, I want to see modern day. Wonder Woman, because we've been tracking. I mean, the first one was about kind of the turn of feminism and, and that this was a little bit different, a little bit more muddled on that front. But I would love to see kind of everything after 2020, after the last few years, kind of Wonder Woman exploding into this time period in, in kind of full modern celebration of her because of she's become crazy even bigger now. So I would love to just... You know, let's take that victory lap. It doesn't have to be hard. We can just take a nice victory lap around the DCEU or whatever we're calling it. But that's my wish. Um, so that's it for me. That's our thoughts on uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Does anybody have any last things they want to get off their chest before we... Any, any I feel like everybody it? should go around and just give it a rating. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, or, All right. yeah. we can, I'll take right. a rating or how you rank it in the DC movies. Or both if you oh, think gosh. you can do it. Okay. Um, I'll just go really quickly. I would rate this a about a 7.5 to 8 out of 10 for me would be. Um, yeah. And I would put it, I don't, you know, funny enough, I don't have a DC movie ranking yet because I don't think the DCEU has gotten into any official sequels yet. This is like the first one. So yeah. it's kind of yeah. hard to judge. I don't even know how to think about it yet. Yeah. Um, Batman vs. Superman is a sequel to Man of Steel. Don't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, that was an event film. So this is actually the first real like sequel. So I'm just kind of putting my thoughts together on that still. But um, yeah, 7.5 7 or 8 out of 10 for me. Yeah, I'm at a seven. I I didn't hate it, and I kind of liked it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm probably at a seven for it, I think, for me. Yeah, I, I guess yeah. I would say it's 7.5 or 8, probably. Yeah. All right. So we're all in general agreement. That's us, but we want to know what you guys think. So hit us up at the at Comic Book Nation Twitter handle or the Comic Book Nation hashtag. We also have plenty of Wonder Woman 1984 breakdowns, insights, Easter eggs, references, analysis, essays on comicbook.com DC. So be sure to check all of that out. 
We are going to take the rest of this week off, but we're going to come back in 2021 strong with season three. Oh, that's that's a two. This is a three. There you go. That's a three. There you go. Yeah, my fingers weren't working. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this has been a crazy season two. Uh, yeah, thank you for everybody who rode with us, all our regulars. We really appreciate you during this crazy pandemic stretch. Ooh, I mean, it's pretty much it's a, it's thanks for everyone who, uh, but, uh, who t- tunes in live because that's uh, a yeah. that's really yeah. been a fun uh, fun aspect that we've added to yeah yeah to the show and so and we're gonna uh, be doing more of it. We're gonna be uh, getting some guests, more fan interaction, live shows, all that's coming in season three. We've been starting, you know, bubbling, working on this stuff. So really excited. But uh, thank you guys again for getting through 2020 with us, and we'll see you in 2021. This is Comic Book Nation. Go see Wonder Woman 1984 if you've somehow listened to this and didn't watch it for some reason. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Bye.